Hello everybody, Dave and Jamie Womack here from Bird Tricks with the one and only Tyler Ruggie in Detroit, Michigan. Now, you probably have seen this video that went crazy where he showed off his 100 most popular pets, or 100 of his pets, uh, and so we're going to do a little collab today that I think you're going to like. So we have asked Tyler today to rate all of his pets, well at least the top 12 most common, from low maintenance to the highest maintenance. Can't wait to see what you guys think is the <laughs> highest maintenance pet he has. So definitely the lowest maintenance, or one of the lowest maintenance pets that I have has to be my tarantulas. Now this can kind of depend on different types of tarantulas. Uh, but just your basic entry level tarantulas, like for example, this is an Arizona blonde tarantula. Very, very simple pets to take care of. Um, now I'm handling mine. I wouldn't recommend handling your tarantula very frequently, if at all, just because of how fragile they can be. But as far as care goes, they really just don't require very much at all. So in the wild, like tarantulas don't spend time exploring and going miles in the wild so they don't need very large enclosures at all. They really only need enough space to create their own little burrow because they're going to spend pretty much all of their time in their burrow, wait for food to come by, and eat it, and that's basically just how they live their lives. <laughs> so I mean same though. But uh, yeah, so really just a small container, little water dish, and they eat insects. and. So tarantula slings, which are the little tiny baby tarantulas, you might feed like once a week, but a full grown tarantula like this, you could still feed them weekly, but really not necessary. I probably feed her once every two to three weeks. Wow. And I just throw like a super worm or a dubia roach in there. And that's really all there is. You don't even have to clean their enclosure. Uh, this is a, New World species of tarantula that its main defense mechanism is it's going to kick hairs off of its abdomen and the hairs get stuck in your skin and it just like it's itchy and uncomfortable but they're not gonna bite you right away and if it did bite you it really you wouldn't have a very bad reaction it's not gonna like kill you or anything but the venom can depend on the type of tarantula you have yeah it's no. crazy what do you guys think uh -uh. No. You want to hold it? I'm going to go for a little bit higher maintenance. Let's see what's <laughs> a little bit more high maintenance. <laughs> okay. Who's going to tie Do you want me to move? Maybe just for a second. <laughs> just <laughs> just <laughs> you. F*** <laughs> you, Dave. <laughs> F*** <laughs> you. <laughs> my palms just got so sweaty. <laughs> Did he like do like a thing on your neck? No, it tickled my neck. <laughs> oh my god. Like I legit broke into a sweat. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if it's what I'm holding. I don't know if it's something that got out of a cage. You reacted well. <laughs> Number 11 on the list brings us to the ball python, Jamie's favorite as you can <laughs> tell. <laughs> I'm really uncomfortable with low maintenance pets. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, the ball python, it was kind of in between a ball python and a corn snake for me, but ball pythons are definitely more chill than corn snakes are. <laughs> and <laughs> Yes. Yeah, very chill, very slow moving usually. So as far as price range for ball pythons, it can range very largely. So as you can see, we're each holding a different morph <laughs> of ball python. There's probably like literally hundreds of morphs like it's crazy the variety that there is that you can choose from and the price ranges so a normal ball python which we have over that's, there that's that's one like jamie's got right yes so that's just a normal i believe you can pro i mean it's almost hard to find normals because no one really even bothers breeding them honestly but you could probably if you found someone selling one get it for like 20 bucks or something um really? But like, honestly, I almost never even see normals at expos or anything. Maybe online you could find one. But yeah, so like $20-ish is probably like the cheapest ball python you could get, which is very inexpensive for a snake. And then, I mean, they can really range up to tens of thousands of dollars, just depending on how rare of a morph it is. But this right here is a VPI Lesser Exanthic ball python. And then I'm holding a banana ball python. Prices vary, so you can either get a normal ball python, really inexpensive, or if you want to, you can get some really fancy morph, just depending 
on your preference and how much you feel like spending, but as far as their care and everything about them pretty much, it doesn't really matter too much what morph you get. The only thing is there's a few morphs you might want to avoid because there are morphs that can cause neurological issues like spider ball pythons, for example. But other than that, they're, care wise, they're all pretty much the same. What's really nice about snakes and ball pythons is you don't have to feed them very often. Like a lot of animals, you have to feed them every day or every other day. Snakes, as uh, like hatchlings to juveniles, you might feed them once a week to every two weeks. And then once you have a full-sized one like Monty down there, like once a month. The main things you need to make sure about as far as their care, things you need to meet are their temperature requirements. You make sure that they have proper temps, proper humidity so that they're shedding fine. And having good temperature and humidity can also affect how well they eat. And you also want to make sure that you have a decent sized enclosure. It doesn't have to be ginormous, but just have a good sized enclosure, big enough for them to stretch out and roam around a little bit and make sure it's full of hides and foliage and things that will make them feel secure so they can go hide. And really the only thing that makes ball pythons a little bit more difficult than some other snakes that made me think, eh, should I say ball python or corn snake, is ball pythons can be picky eaters sometimes, and it can really depend on a variable of different things, like it could be your care that's wrong, it could be your handling them and stressing them out too much, or it could just be that they're going on a hunger strike for fun. And sometimes <laughs> when that happens, you have to either wait it out and hope that they eat their prey, or you have to go off of Frozen and try feeding them live once, hopefully only once, and they'll go back to Frozen hopefully. But other than the occasional issue with going off of food, very easy snakes, very chill, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, they're, they're really good. You again. <laughs> so like, do they feel the way you would imagine that they would feel, basically, or? They feel more grippy to me. Grippy? Yeah. Because a lot of people think snakes are slimy. Is oh. that like something you would assume at all or no? I wouldn't assume they're slimy. Okay. But like the whole thing feels like a muscle. Yeah. And I, that's what freaks me out. Because like the first, the first time a monkey got on me, I was like, okay, until I felt the tail Yeah. that felt like another really strong It does strong feel like arm, a monkey tail. And yeah. it feels like a monkey tail, and I'm just like, the whole thing is strong. Like, yeah. the whole thing, no matter where you touch, is like right. a muscle. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it, it is pretty much all muscle. They're <laughs> constrictors, so that's how they kill their prey, is they strangle them to death. So they need to be pretty okay. strong. <laughs> yeah. And it's even crazier when you hold, like, a really big snake, like a retic, because it just like, you can really just feel like how heavy and strong, just like pure muscle. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think that's what intimidates <laughs> me. It's yeah. just every part of it is strong, so there's no... It's like a who do yeah. handcuff escape here. <laughs> <They> can, <laughs> Are you stuck? <laughs> yeah, they can get a good grip on you. Your next magic act. <laughs> right. I like when they more compact themselves. It's nice versus like find areas Versus. to go, and then I'm like, ooh, yeah. No, so they are way. pretty cool, though. So how do you guys feel about ball pythons? Would you get one? Capri's trying to talk us into it. I, Actually, Capri's trying to talk Jamie into it. Yeah, Dave's I'm, already I'm talked into it. I, I don't want one. No offense. You've been very nice to me. Oh, Even Monty didn't you. change your mind? But I <laughs> don't really want animals that aren't compatible with birds. That yep. makes perfect sense. And this animal is not compatible with a bird. <laughs> 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 Just saying. Um, but also, I think the other thing that... I don't know if it bums me out about this type of animal or not, but I kind of am bummed that they... Like you were kind of saying, the more interaction, it kind of can stress them out. Yeah. And I think Capri's under the impression that she could hang out with it every day and, like, do her homework with it, just hanging out with her and stuff. And, like, that sounds really cute, but if that, mm -hmm. in reality, stresses out this type of animal, yeah, then that kind of bums me out a little bit. Yeah. If you're going to get any snake, I would say a ball python's the one that handles uh, being... Yeah, handles being handled the best. Yeah. Uh, they can definitely... You can definitely have... If you have a really chill ball python, you can definitely have it on you. For a little while, but yeah, definitely I wouldn't want to handle them every single day or anything like that. Ooh. But 
just tight. Yeah, it can depend on the snake, but they definitely <laughs> are the most tolerant of handling, in my opinion. When you say for a little while, how much how much time? I mean, it really depends. Like, if you put your ball python on you and he wraps oh, around sorry. you and just chills there, <laughs> then, I mean, you could hold him, I guess, like, an hour. Like, I don't know, as long as he'll stay put, but... If he starts trying to leave you and getting restless, I would probably just put them back in their enclosure. And another thing that I wanted to mention that I was talking to you guys about before is after feeding, you don't want to uh, handle them at all for a couple days so that they have time to digest their food. I can't get my hand. <laughs> <laughs> and ball pythons tend to just go in their hide and curl up in a ball and you don't really see them very much unless you maybe walk in the room in the middle of the night and see them out and about. So that's another big difference. If you want a snake that's more of like a look, don't touch type of thing, a corn snake can be really good. Of course, you can no, handle no. them. No, 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 no. Put it back on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think everybody's educated. Oh, all right. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> All right, and at number 10, we have crested geckos, which this is my first experience with them. So awesome. I heard that they are common. <laughs> and they are crested. Yes, they're definitely increasing in popularity. So we have a ton of crested geckos because we breed them. Um, so crested geckos are honestly probably, they're definitely like, I think the easiest lizard you could possibly take care of. So if anyone ever asks me like what reptile they should get i either recommend like a corn snake ball python or a crested gecko so crested geckos again they range in price a lot you can get a cheap crested gecko for like 50 dollars you can get some really fancy expensive crested gecko for like eight thousand dollars if you want to now um, what are some of the things that make them so easy because he looks pretty active so that seems like a hard pet to be able to have out and enjoy yeah so their temperament as far as handleability, again, varies based on individuals, but they are definitely known to jump off of you and try to run away. Some are really chill, like this one. He's very chill for a crested gecko, like for the most part. He might walk around a little bit, but he's not actively trying to leap to his death, which is really nice. As far as their care requirements go, they are just like one of the most simple reptiles you could possibly get. So as far as enclosure size goes, they don't require a very large enclosure. For an adult, you're going to want like an 18 by 18 by 24. Um, they're arboreal, so they need a vertical setup, and they like lots of sticks and branches and plants and stuff to climb in. And what's really nice about crested geckos is they do not require a diet of just insects. They actually make a gecko diet. Um, different brands, there's different kinds, but it's basically just a powder that you mix with water and you put it in a little cup in there and they eat it and it's a complete diet that has everything they need in it. That's cool. They make ones that have insects in it, so they do eat insects in the wild and I personally recommend giving them live insects maybe a couple times a week, but for the most part they just need the crested gecko diet and you don't have to worry about anything else. Unlike a lot of other reptiles, they do just fine at room temperature. So like between 70 to about 78 degrees, you don't want it to get up past 80. Uh, um, so they don't need an external heat source. So how do you guys feel about crested gecko then? Uh, I still think I want to go higher maintenance. What do I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Number nine is hedgehogs. So specifically, the most common hedgehogs people keep as pets are like African pygmy hedgehogs. That's the kind I have. Not holding her right now because she's nocturnal, she's sleeping. I tried to show her to you guys and she was not very happy about being woken up, so didn't want to disrupt her. So this is starting to enter the territory of definitely a little bit higher maintenance pets. I think in general, mammals are just more maintenance than a lot of reptiles are. So hedgehogs, I would say the most difficult thing about them is how messy they are. So lots of cleaning is involved. You also have to cut their nails. So why would you want a hedgehog? You said this, <laughs> this is like owning a hippo in a small enclosure. <laughs> well, they're very cute. Okay, that's, right. but but they're also illegal in some states, right? That's true. Yeah, like California, for example. Well, everything's illegal in California. But true. Pittsburgh. I was surprised that that you couldn't have a hedgehog in Pittsburgh. Oh really? And also another really fun thing they do. I think it's called anointing. 
Yeah. Sounds like annoying. <laughs> it <laughs> is. <laughs> so, so cute. Sometimes when they find something that they like the smell of it, they'll chew it up and spit it onto their backs. Huh. <laughs> See, anyways, they're disgusting, but they're very cute. Um, as long as you're okay with cleaning up after them. <laughs> like husbands. <laughs> and this brings us finally to number eight on the list, the blue-tongued skink. This is a very interesting looking creature. <laughs> yeah, they're very cool lizards. So a lot of people compare them to like the way a snake looks, kind of like the shape of their face. They're very long and they have small stubby feet and they have slightly different care requirements, but very similar, just slight differences in temperature and humidity mostly. Overall, they're like, they're pretty easy as far as like, if you want a bigger lizard. So blue tongue skinks, have a pretty simple diet requirement. Again, kind of like hedgehogs, they're like scavengers. They'll just wander around eating whatever they can find mostly. <laughs> I'm holding him like this because his nails are very sharp and it hurts because they dig into my skin. Yeah, you guys can't hear it there, but every time you make a movement and like kind of pull them, it sounds like Velcro just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're very sharp nails, but it's worth it. Uh, they do need a heat bulb. They need a decent temperature again. The locality is going to determine what temperature you need specifically. So this is like an Indonesian blue tongue skink. So you want to replicate the temperature of the area of Indonesia that they're from. All right, moving up the list at number seven, we have a bearded dragon, which I've actually heard of before today. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> so why are these guys so common and why are they a little bit more higher maintenance than any of the animals we've seen so far? Why they're so common? Good question. I think it's because, I mean, they sell them everywhere. PetSmart, Petco, any pet store you go to, they're gonna have bearded dragons. And they often encourage bearded dragons to beginner reptile owners, which most experienced reptile owners would disagree with that, honestly, because they just have very specific care requirements in every way, mm -hmm. unlike some of the other things that I mentioned before. For example, they require a very high temperature that you need to reach so they can properly digest their food. I keep his basking temperature around 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So you need a nice strong heat bulb and you need to make sure it's the proper temperature um, another thing is UVB is extremely important and UVB can be confusing because they, they make so many different types of UVB bulbs, different shapes, sizes, and different outputs. It gets very confusing and people just so frequently end up messing something up. Now this one Whoa. seemed very social. Every time we'd go over to his enclosure, he was like, huh? Yeah. Do you have crickets? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. I can only imagine what's going through his mind, but they seem more social than, uh, than some of the other creatures we met today. Yeah, so I mean, I, it was definitely that he thought you had bugs probably, yeah. mostly. He but, loves me. Uh, <laughs> he, they are tolerant of handling usually. Again, some of them can be aggressive, but for the most part, they are pretty chill. Um, Here, hold your hands up. Yeah. It's cool. He feels, it feels interesting. What if he jumps off of me? Don't let him. He'll be fine. I was going to get a cricket, but there's none left in that tub and it oh. smells so gross. Right? It's like yeah. the thorny and... Not only do they eat a ton of insects, but they also eat like leafy greens. They're omnivores, so it just gets very specific because a lot of reptiles you just have to feed them insects and that's it. With bearded dragons, there's a certain percentage of plant matter you need to get into their diet and a certain percentage of protein. And it just kind of sucks having to have a bunch of vegetables on hand all the time on top of a constant supply of like crickets or super worms or roaches. So it's it's just like a little bit more intense care requirements than the other reptiles, for example, that I mentioned. Nope, turn them around. He's <laughs> happy now, look. <laughs> okay, as long as he doesn't jump. Do they jump? Yeah. He's, felt, he's about to walk and lick. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> now he's good. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, th there's just a lot of specifics that go into their care, and it's not to say it looks like he's about. Oh! Here you go. <laughs> over the it? towel. Put him over the towel. <laughs> so yeah. I like how fast you handed him back. <laughs> just not even to the ground. Just straight <laughs> to the I don't want to ruin the carpet. <laughs> Next we have fish. Um, so I, I think a lot of people are a little bit surprised when I talk about how I think fish are like kind of a lot of work. A lot of people tend to just like put a fish in a bowl <laughs> of water and they're like, 
yes. Look at my pet fish. It will live for three <laughs> months. <laughs> and that is it. But if you do it properly, it is a lot of work. Uh, it can differ freshwater to saltwater. Saltwater is definitely more work in my opinion. But the main thing with aquarium keeping is there's a lot of different water parameters that you have to test and keep track of. Make sure ammonia, nitrite, nitrates, nothing's getting too high because it can cause your fish to die. You know, you need to have a good filter, you need to cycle the tank, which is a process that a lot of people skip, which is where you allow the filter to run in the tank before actually adding fish so beneficial bacteria can build up in the filter, and that beneficial bacteria is what's going to take care of the ammonia in the tank. Hmm. So people just don't think about that, and they think that if they change the water constantly that it's fine, but that can actually shock the fish because it's like constantly being introduced to different water parameters and mm. can stress them out. There's a lot that goes into fish keeping that I think just a lot of people don't look into it very much and just assume that it's really easy and yeah. they can keep a fish in like whatever size tank they want and they don't really have to do anything or, yeah. you know, certain fish require certain temperatures of water. So certain fish eat other fish that might be in the same tank. Yes. Like you, you can't just throw any fish together. Number five on the list is bunnies or rabbits. So cute. So this is Olive, my rabbit. So rabbits are pretty high maintenance. I think again, rabbits are, uh, they're, well, they're really cute. So a lot of people want them, but not a lot of people give them what they need, which is unfortunate. Sad. So, <laughs> there's like hair getting all over my face. I, yeah, this shouldn't be surprising, but I guess to some people it is. They actually do need space to run around because they are actually a creature that like runs around outside. Unlike reptiles, as I was saying, uh, they, they do like their share of exercise. So, keeping them in one of those tiny cages where they only have room to like turn around and like poop in the corner. Yeah. Not sure why people keep them like that or who thought that that was like an okay standard for them. I do feel like a lot of people are doing better with rabbits now. Um, a lot of people are like free roaming them in the house, which is good, or at least giving them like a nice big playpen area is ideal. So they do need a decent amount of space and ideally time to run around the house and free roam supervised uh, as well but a lot of people just aren't able to provide that or don't want to. Um, a lot of people just want a cute animal that they can keep in a tiny cage. Uh, <laughs> can you litter box train them then? Like if yes. they are free roaming? Yeah, you can litter box train them. Yeah. I know when, when I film my rabbits, you can usually see like the pieces of hair like really? floating past the camera. <laughs> so <laughs> that would hope, talk me hopefully you see that. Some rabbits won't like each other. Like they will literally fight each other and then some will like they'll just get along and they'll love each other. So uh, <laughs> Olive was the one Desmond chose. And then, uh, yeah, they were just like best friends. They would cuddle with each other all the time, always be by each other's side, very cute. And in the wild too, they're just very social animals. So there are some special cases where a rabbit is just like, heck you to every other rabbit and doesn't want a friend. But in most cases, I would say you're gonna wanna have like a bonded pair. So since uh, my other rabbit passed away, I actually do need to go and do some speed dating. Do the speed dating thing again, yes. What about for your rabbit? So, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> At number four, we have Koo, the pigeon. <laughs> it's actually Cooper, right? Yeah. But it's C O O dash P E R. Yes, yeah. Cooper. Cooper. <laughs> so what makes pigeons so high maintenance? Because well, they are a they're a bird. So birds just tend to be kind of higher maintenance animals. What makes them more difficult is probably mostly the mess factor. Number one, well, the obvious one, they poop a lot. So they poop all over their cage and everywhere they go, basically. You'll notice that Cooper has <laughs> a flyper. So what's nice about this is if he poops, it just goes into a little pad at the bottom and it actually doesn't touch him at all, which is nice, so it's not gonna get like on him or anything, and you just change the pad out. And as you can see, he's like, he's completely comfortable in it, it doesn't bother him at all. Yeah, and he's been hanging out in that for, well, since like lunch, so. Yeah, a couple hours. Aside from the poop, they're very dusty animals. So if any of you guys have like an African gray at home, for example, you know that they're very dusty. Pigeons are even dustier than that, so. 
definitely, if you get a pigeon, invest in some air purifiers and be prepared to have to dust every surface and vacuum and just, yeah. Yeah, I believe the quote was like, all right, I vacuumed the air, you can go in. <laughs> yeah, that's what Maddie said before we went in the pigeon rooms. So yeah, if you, definitely if you have allergies or if you're just sensitive to dust or dander, then you definitely want to think twice about getting a pigeon. So number three on the list, we have... Cats! Yes, we have cats. She's looking at me like, the heck? Offensive. So this is Ellie, our cat. <laughs> number three on the list is dog. Obviously this is going to depend on a lot of things, like what kind of dog you have, what kind of personality your dog has. Ellie is a border collie, so you know. She does require a lot of stimulation, exercise, but overall she's usually pretty well behaved. You could go through the trash yesterday, but other than that, usually, <laughs> usually pretty good. The eye contact is amazing. <laughs> yeah, she's very aware. She knows exactly what I'm saying. So I try to take her out and take her for walks or play disc with her often because Ellie's pretty good, but a lot of Border Collies will go kind of crazy if you don't exercise them enough. Um, and that can turn into aggression and like, yeah, well, unwanted behaviors, right? Yeah, there's a lot of issues that can come if you don't exercise a dog breed properly that needs exercise. So, yeah, <laughs> you're you're a little bit higher maintenance, but you're you're not number one. Number two on the list is turtles and or tortoises. And yeah. That one kind of surprises me that they're that high maintenance. Yeah. So these two are very different animals as far as care goes, but. I would say they're probably about in the same range of, like, just the difficulty or, like, just the... Requirements. Like, the requirements. Like, not a lot of people can reach their requirements. But, yeah, so one of the things we were talking about was overall space requirements, and we run into this a lot with the parrot industry, is, you know, people that live in a one-bedroom apartment are wondering why the bird can't get enough sleep, when yeah. the reality is one-bedroom apartment is really... I can't... I can maybe think of a couple of exceptions, but in, in the most general terms, really not a good idea. Right. And I think that that's kind of where you were going with these guys, where it's just like, you need the space yes. that fits their needs a little better, right? Yeah, because people often see these guys at the store, and they're really small. They don't stay that small, though. Or people, especially with the sliders. So this is a yellow-bellied slider, but you're more often going to see red-eared sliders, but they're very, very similar as far as care goes and everything. It's mostly just they look a bit different. I feel like I'm just holding a heavy shell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. <know>. Good turtle. <laughs> <laughs> so basically the rule of thumb people use about for sliders is for every inch of their shell, they need 10 gallons of water and they average around 10 to 12 inches usually about. So that means they need around 100 to 120 gallons minimum, wow. which is a big tank. And a lot of people don't have space for that size tank or they just simply don't want to have that size tank, but they still want the turtle, which is an issue. And also if it tells you anything, both of these are kind of like rescue slash rehome situations where like they were not really being taken care of, especially the turtle over here was being kept in a 20 gallon tank at that size. He was about like 10 13. years old, 13 when I got him, 13 when I got him. So he was kept like that for 13 years. I'm amazed that he d isn't like more malformed because it can cause their shells to just get all messed up if they're not having the proper like diet and lighting and all that stuff and just everything was wrong. She couldn't mm -hmm. swim. Yeah, she couldn't swim because the enclosure was so small. She didn't have enough water to swim in. So I had to just slowly get her used to swimming. She's doing really good now, but people just don't realize how much space a turtle requires and also their lifespan. People say sliders live like 20 years, but that's if they're not taken care of. They're pretty hardy. As you can see, this one lived like 13 years in neglect. But mm -hmm. if a turtle's being well taken care of, they can live into their 50s. Wow. So, yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah, they can live a long time, but just they're more often neglected than taken care of. And it's also another issue where people will get them when they're small, when they're bigger, they like dump them at the local pond or something and they become invasive. 
That's another big issue. So definitely don't get a turtle unless you want to get a big tank and have it for like 50 years. <laughs> as far as the sulcata tortoise goes, they are land dwelling, so you don't need a big tank of water. However, they get really big. So although this, this is a very small tortoise, she will one day reach 100 plus pounds. So they need a really big area to roam around in. A lot of people keep them in outdoor enclosures. I actually found her on the side of the road uh, in a parking lot, so she was just wandering around. Obviously, you know, they're not from Michigan, so someone <laughs> either released her because they didn't want her anymore or she escaped, but I couldn't find any owner or anyone looking for this kind of tortoise, so I kind of think someone probably released her or maybe just didn't really care that it went missing. I don't know. All right, so the number one highest maintenance pets I have by far has to be my parrots. Might not be that surprising to a lot of you guys, but they are a very high maintenance animal, especially, well, Gizmo, my severe macaw, but also my African Grey. They're just, they're probably the most intelligent animals that I have. As you know, every interaction is a training session. So right now he's either learning to do more of the good behavior or more of the bad behavior. And so the environmental factors have a huge play in that. It's not just put it in the cage and let him be. Um, it, yeah. it requires so much more interaction. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is like all the toys and all the stimulation that you provide a parrot versus other enclosures. Like a lot of yeah. your other enclosures seem to be almost self-working. Yeah. And these guys, obviously, they're hopefully destroying a lot of their environment and then you're replacing it. Yeah. So that seems to be something that's a little bit higher maintenance. And then obviously their diets are very complex. Their sleeping habits are a little bit harder to maintain, I think, than something that requires maybe a smaller enclosure. For sure. Um, just all those things. Yeah. And you brought up a good point how a lot of my reptile enclosures kind of maintain themselves because I keep a lot of things in bioactive. Birds not only poop all over their cages, but they fly all over your house and poop everywhere. So <laughs> that's also really fun. Yes, Gizmo. Too bad the towel <laughs> on your lap is not in the frame right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I don't think people, at least in our channel, are very familiar with your backstory. It has he poops. Uh, the backstory of Gizmo, can you kind of like summarize how you got him and how that came to be? Because I thought that was really relevant to the whole point of this being the number one highest maintenance, maintenance bird because he wasn't just your bird. Yeah, for sure. So Gizmo, I've had him my entire life. He actually belonged to my parents before he was in my care. So my parents got him a few years before I was born. So Gizmo's, I think, 29, almost 30 years old. Yeah, <laughs> kind of crazy you're getting there, huh? So <laughs> yeah, I've had him my entire life. Uh, my parents didn't have that much time to spend with him, unfortunately, after they had kids, so he didn't get as much attention as he probably should have had. So my entire time growing up, we were not really good friends, to say the least. Like, I, yeah, he did not like me very much. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Which I think is a great testament because, as, at least in the car on the way here, you were talking about that and yeah. how he was kind of scary to you as a kid, and then you literally grew up and said, I'm going to take him with me. Yeah. Most kids would have been like, see ya! <laughs> yeah, know? well, I wanted a bird that could be my own and one that I would actually get along with, and I tried to kind of get Gizmo to warm up with me, but it never really worked out before. And then I ended up getting my son, Conyer Mango, and I just ended up falling in love with having birds once I figured out, like, the kind of bond you can have with a bird that you're actually doing it right with, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I just, I ended up loving birds, and then when I moved out, I just figured, you know, I'll take Gizmo with me. I figured I could give him more attention, and maybe things would kind of get better. And they did, after a while. It took a while, but we're getting there. Isn't that right, Gizmo? <laughs> We well, yeah. definitely touch on something that I think is probably one of the top reasons why they are such a difficult animal to keep in captivity, and that is the emotional element where, mm -hmm. you know, it's really interesting having a bird that gets rehomed literally to a new home, new family, and all those uh, different challenges, but when it's going from a parent to a child, it feels a lot like less, a re like less of a rehoming scenario, and yeah. so the bird has a consistent set of people in his life, yeah. but that's not normally the case, sadly. They get put in rescues, and, and people that really have good intentions of rescuing maybe don't have the skills to do it properly, right. and that cycle continues where the birds have this emotional bond, or mm -hmm. appears to be an emotional bond with people, and then they just get 
tossed upside down time and time again by going from home to home. So yeah. And something really cool, which is like the second time I've heard it this month at least, we have a free flight student. She's only 14 years old. And she decided to do free flight with her family bird. So they oh. also had a macaw before she was born. And then she grew up with this macaw, also a bit intimidated by it, but mm -hmm. still interacted. And she just like kind of pushed her way through and was like, you know what? I'm going to work with the bird I have at home versus go out and get a new one. That's so awesome. I love those stories of the kids not being overly intimidated, not having maybe too many negative experiences that would discourage you mm -hmm. from birds and actually pushing yeah. through and having that relationship. So yeah. I love it. Yeah.